Uh, my name is Bill Pitzer, and welcome to uh, Practice Safe Design, Use a Concept. Um, we're going to talk a little bit today about creativity and ideas and uh, harnessing visual perception. So uh, just as a little game here, we'll start off with, I want you to close your eyes, and I want you to think about the U.S. Capitol building. To get that in your mind, how many people have an image in their mind? All right. So now I want you to think about your name. Whatever your name is, think about that with your eyes closed. How many people have an image for that? How many people have a word? They're seeing a word. All right. So words and images. They're really kind of magical, and they can do a lot for us. And that's sort of the essence of what we're going to talk about. We um, actually find ourselves that we live in a, uh, a world of metaphors. This is Mark Tanzi's painting, Purity Test. Uh, and he painted these Native American warriors staring down from this promontory point over the Great Salt Lake. And they're peering at. Uh, Robert Smithson's uh, land sculpture, Spiral Jetty, sort of like they're wondering, trying to decipher this image in their minds, trying probably to think about the metaphor of that image. Uh, it's been said that metaphors are the tip of the mind's iceberg. And we live in sort of an imaginary world within our minds. We like to think that it's rational but actually we're fairly irrational the way our minds work. Uh, metaphors are unidirectional. They go from the con concrete to the abstract. Uh, if you say he's clean, that can mean that he doesn't have a criminal record. But if you say he's moral, that doesn't mean that he's bathed recently. So there's a direction that metaphors use. And uh, metaphors are fixed, they have a fixed mapping. The, the words are just the veneer. It's just the outside of it. What happens with the structure and everything goes on inside our minds. Bonus question, anybody know this guy? Pauling. Linus Pauling, absolutely. The eminent chemist, Nobel Prize winner, discoverer of the covalent bond, also the first guy to pick out that there was a helix in DNA, but he didn't quite get that right. Watson and Crick actually read the letters to his son that was in, at the university where they were, and they figured it was a double helix. But he was a very interesting guy, and he used to talk about ideas a lot. And he would say, if you want a good idea, you need lots of ideas. And so the first thing I wanted to share with you today is this idea of creativity and, and some rules that we can look at. I brought a handout for you. You can come down and get these later. And also on the board, on the bottom, is a web address where you can download this. And it's a little piece of paper that folds up to make a booklet. And this was a creativity guide that I did for some editors a few years ago. And it had some rules in it. Not really rules, but sort of the suggestions. Number one was, this is the one I was able to put my name on. Freedom is an essential element of creativity. Uh, one of the most creative things I did when I was a kid, I lived on uh, Randolph Street on the west side of Charleston. If you know anything about Charleston, West Virginia, you know on the west side there's a place called Five Corners. I grew up about a block away on Randolph Street. And at the end of the street there was a stoplight. And my brothers and our neighbors and I would often play street football on Randolph Street. And we'd call the signals when the light was red and we'd run the plays, when, or I mean when it was green, and we'd run the plays when the light was red so the traffic wouldn't run us over. But we had a lot of freedom because it was street football. No one cared. We made up the rules each time we played. What's the rules going to be for this game? So that's an essential thing for creativity. The second one, and the rest of these come from a company called IDEO. Is anyone familiar with IDEO? They're probably the preeminent design company in the world. 
I'd encourage you to Google IDEO, go to their website. They have a lot of stuff about what they do. And they are specialists at design, at the process of design, the process of innovation. So these are some of their mantras that they use. Fresh ideas come faster in a fun place. I think inherently we all know that that's true. A lot of companies just don't follow through with that. They don't get that. They don't get that you need to have that freedom and to have a little bit of a fun place. Number three, and this is a great one, build on the ideas of others. I'm going to show you a couple examples later of how I've taken an idea from a graphic novel and built a little bit on it, something that you can do yourselves. Number four, encourage wild ideas. If you were in here this morning and you listened to um, Ray and Dennis and then later Larry, they talked a lot about this. Uh, they were calling it the aha thing. But you've got to have wild ideas because if you don't have the wild ideas, you don't get that sort of aha. I mean, that's where it comes from. So you've got to encourage that. And the wilder the idea sometimes, the further it takes you along. And I, you know, I do that. I don't know how you process a, a concept or an idea, but a lot of times I'll do that on purpose. I'll take the polarity. I'll go one direction as wild as far as I can go, and the other direction goes wild and as far as I can go and see where it takes me. This is a, a super, super one. Fail often to succeed sooner. How many people work for a company or work in an environment that rewards failure? No, no hands. I wonder why that is. There's a great commercial a few years ago that Michael Jordan did for Nike. And in the commercial, he says, I'm a success because I failed over and over again. It's really an important concept. And number six, if anyone's done the Myers-Briggs, you know all about the J part, the judgment part. You have to defer judgment. And that's a trained skill, I would say. You can train yourself to do that. And this is the, you'll see in the guide, this is the cover in the, in the back. Uh, the one image is Picasso's, well, he called them auto portraits. That sounds sexier than self-portrait, I guess. The first one uh, was his self-portrait in 1901. The other one is his self-portrait in 1972. And a great Picasso quote, every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. Probably the best thing that I think he's probably said in terms of giving you an insight into creativity. So let's talk a little bit about visual perception. Images and words are seen simultaneously. We view them at the same time. If you look at an ad in a magazine, if you look at a commercial on TV, if you're looking at an interactive something on the web, we see them simultaneously. You need no better example of how important design is than to know that that happens simultaneously. The container that the content is in is seen by the individual at the same time that they're looking at the content. But what's going on inside of our heads? Our minds process that into different channels. We have a verbal channel, visual channel, and an auditory channel. And you can prove that because you pick up things when you call stuff out of the deep recesses of your minds, you pick up on that. I've done a lot of freelance work. And I typically work in a studio in my house. And I, if you say to me, you remember that time you did that cutaway graphic of the National Cathedral from Knight Ritter that you worked on for three days in a row, the things that pop up in my mind are like what TV show I was listening to in the background while I was working on that, or something that one of my sons came in and did or said while I was working on that. All that stuff is in there, and it gets popped and pulled out in really interesting ways. 
So we have three parts of our memory that plays into this. We have uh, a sensory memory, which is very brief. It works in hundreds of milliseconds. Even though we don't know it, our eyes are constantly taking in data. The eyes are constantly moving around. And you'll fixate on small things and stop and move. And you'll move here and look here. Even as you're talking to me, you're probably not just staring at me. You may be looking around. Someone moves next to you. You look at them. All that sensory data is pouring into us. And it pours into a work floor that's called working memory, sometimes also known as short-term memory. And that's where we process it. That is where we analyze it. And we merge it with stuff that's already in our heads, prior knowledge. And that prior knowledge is sort of textured and layered through our cultural experience, our educational background. It's the kind of things that mix up in your head when all this information pours in there. And the third part of that is a permanent memory sometimes referred to as your long-term memory. And it's like a storage cabinet where all this stuff exists. It um, uses semantic items, which is sort of the stuff that we attach meaning to. It uses episodic events, which is high, that's highly autobiographical. And you also have a procedural memory, which is repetitive things. Once you learn, it's like you learn to ride a bike, you always remember to ride a bike. That's embedded in your procedural memory. So all those things are in there. So keeping that in mind, I wanted to talk with you about three approaches that you can use when you're thinking about how to design content. Or if you're thinking about what is my concept, how am I going to do this? And this is sort of a mini version of what Ray and Dennis were talking about. They were talking about sort of the end point of this when you get this aha thing that actually comes out and it becomes an entity into itself. But before you get there, you've got to think about how am I going to approach this. The first one is representational. And you often see this in pet food, right? because it shows the dog or the cat, and they come running, and they want the food. And it's, it's fairly literal. It represents reality as we experience it. And here, of course, they're picking up on another little colloquialism of garbage in, garbage out. So they're playing off of that. But that's an example of a representational image or a representational approach. This is an example of the abstract. And you can imagine what the abstract does. It, it, it doesn't talk about the product itself. It expresses a characteristic or something that, that is enabled by the product. It's sort of, um, well, it's primal. It's emotional. And most of you have seen this enough to know that this guy is. And he doesn't often drink beer, but when he does, he drinks. Man, I tell you, talk about something that really works in the abstract form. So you can use this for all kinds of things. And it gives you sort of a, um, well, it's sort of like a fence you put around it. So you're working on a concept, and you're thinking, well, sort of the direction we need to go with this, it's representational. So you kind of have this representational fence that you work with. If you have something abstract, it's the same thing. It gives you a boundary, a sort of a jumping off point that you can play off of. And this is an example of a symbolic image, all right? So what's the symbol of a hand with a thumb up like that? What's it make you think of? A lighter or flicking a match, right? And I don't know if you can see it here, but this is a hot sauce that they're selling. So the, the, uh, the symbolic goes beyond the abstract. And it's arbitrary. It's things that we attach meaning to. A good example of a symbolic style of something is like a subway map, where it's very you know, linear with lines and symbols. And we attach meaning to it, but we can actually use it to maneuver space. So those are three um, 
three different approaches that you can use. And the problem with all of this is that we live in a world of metaphors. So what often is in your mind is not in the mind of the other people. So one of the things, one of the things that I've done is use this whole concept of metaphors and abstract, representational, symbolic, to come up with concepts. And I uh, used to do editorial cartoons. And when I was doing editorial cartoons, I worked with a guy, Henry Payne, who uh, stayed an editorial cartoonist and still is doing editorial cartoons in Detroit. And, and he and I worked out a plan once that we would share some ideas about how to get ideas. And this is something that, that Henry showed me. So we're going to do a sort of interactive uh, thing here, audience participation. I wanted to do a cartoon. And I don't know if you can see uh, all these words, but that's OK. There's a little shadow here. I wanted to do a cartoon, and it was about drug use in the United States. So we'll put U.S. on one side and drugs on the other side. So we'll take the U.S. side first. And don't be bashful. Just shout it right out. Any kind of image, icon, word that says, makes you think United States. OK, hang on. Statue of Liberty. Okay, Uncle Sam, Eagle, Shape of Country, what else? Map, anything else? Stars and Stripes. White House. Anything else? Lewis and Clark. Lewis and Clark. <laughs> George Washington. Cowboy. Cowboy. That kind of goes with the Lewis and Clark. Now, you know, I'm not sure what part of the memory the Lewis and Clark thing came out of, but that's kind of an interesting one. I've done this a few times. I've not had a Lewis and Clark before. <laughs> I live out west there on all the road signs out that way. So well, there you go. <coughs> all right. OK, so now we're going to do the same thing. Let me just mention this quickly. I've done this in a couple of elementary schools. I've got myself into a little bit of a fix on the drug side of things. But since this is not an elementary school, I think I'll be OK. <laughs> Okay, so things that make you think drugs. Marijuana leaf. What's that look like? Could you draw it for me? <laughs> okay. We'll just write up there Mary Jane for the marijuana. Beetles? Beetles. Oh, needles. Oh, I thought you said beetles. <laughs> Needles came in, beetles came out. <laughs> it's not my, it's not my intention. It just happened that way. Sorry. Mortar and pestles. The mortar and pestles. Mortar and pestles. Okay, yeah, like at a pharmacy, right? A mirror and a line. Sorry. A mirror and a line. There you go. A bottle of pills. Sticky. Bottle of pills. Oh. Rx. Rx. What else? White powder. Drug dog. Jail. Nancy Reagan. Jail, Nancy <laughs> Reagan. This is great. This is great. Nancy Reagan. <laughs> oh, man. The, the, the Lewis and Clark of the drug world, Cheech and Chong. Oh, man, just, you guys are making my day. This is so much fun. Anything else? Hippies. Hippies? 
Yeah, yeah, maybe we better hold it then. Okay, so you, you play this little game, you write these words down. And the next thing you do is you look for connections. You know? And, and what happens is oftentimes when you do this, you end up with things that happen. And you end up with a what if. I could maybe do something with Uncle Sam in a map. And what if I could do something that builds off of the mirror line, the white powder? What if I could take that and somehow come up with something? The map of North America, the cocaine projection, right? Because maps have projections. And the thing that made this work visually was, and I can't put my hand on this to show you, but if you kind of put your hand up there and hide the top of the hat, it, it doesn't quite work without Uncle Sam's hat being in there all the way. But you know, his nose became Central America and his beard flipped out and became Florida. And uh, the pile of white powder was Colombia and South America. And so there's Uncle Sam snorting up all the drugs from South America. And that's how that happened. We just recreated it, which I think hopefully proves to you that it works. And I'm always nervous because you never know if it's going to work. But some icons are really deeply seated in our minds. We'll come back to uh, this idea of using lists like this in a minute. But I wanted to talk a little bit about harnessing this and doing something graphically with it that might be a tool that you can use. Um, I was able to stop off uh, on the way up here. I, I drove this time. I live in North Carolina. And I stopped off and had lunch with uh, Jim Rogers, who was one of my uh, art professors at Glenville State College, where I uh, did my undergrad. And I uh, went from being a pioneer to a mountaineer, but not a West Virginia mountaineer. I got my master's at Appalachian State up in Boone, which is also a mountaineer land. And ironically, some of the streets are even named the same as they are here. Um, but it was great seeing him. He, he, you know, he's not in good health and all, and he, he saved a bunch of my artwork and stuff over the years from my, my uh, newspaper career and brought those with me, and I brought some stuff to show him. And the reason I uh, put this picture in here is that we used to have these discussions. And I found this to be true, especially working in a deadline-oriented world like a newspaper, that so often it seemed like fundamentals came into play. And, and I wonder, was it because fundamentals are a, a crutch, something you rely on, or is it because of the time element? What is it about fundamentals that seem to always bring them out? Um, and Mr. Rogers at one time said to me, no, you know, fundamentals are important because that's the basis of everything that we do. That's why we focus on them. That's why pianists, even once they become concert pianists, still run scales and practice. Because those fundamentals are the working parts that we use. And if you get a chance, uh, uh, anyone who, are there any people that have taken IMC 635 here? Thank you. Thank you. So we spent a lot of time talking about graphic principles and fundamentals. And we get into dot, line, shape, form, all that stuff. But we didn't have time to go through all of that today. So I wanted just to talk about one thing that maybe each of us could do that would help with this. So it's part of the fundamentals. But I like using the analogy of a, a baseball uh, game. And uh, when I was uh, coaching baseball, I taught my kids that practice was work and games were fun. And we never did game stuff in practice. And we never did practice stuff when we were at a game. The practices that I designed for, for the kids were all about skills and fundamentals and working on those. We never did any 
you know, imaginary games, none of that stuff. It was all skill. And so when it came game day, it's, they were mostly relaxed and had fun. And, and that's sort of the building block about it. That's what's great about fundamentals, is it can take you down that pathway. Dave McKeon, any, any Dave McKeon fans out here? Graphic uh, novelist extraordinaire. Done a lot of stuff with Neil Gaiman, another name you might know. And uh, I, I've been doing some work for a company. I will show you some stuff that I've been doing for them. And uh, it was pretty interesting because I'd looked at Cages before and read it. It's an amazing uh, graphic novel. If, you, if, you're, if you even remotely think you might like to look at it, you should at least go to the library and see if they got a copy and look through it. And uh, the quote at the bottom of the book here, you probably can't read up there, it says mesmerizing <laughs> is the one word and quote about the book. But in it, you'll notice, and I didn't pick up on this the first time, but the second time through I did. He uses throughout the book this three by three grid. And he does two things with it. He uses it like a movie maker uses a frame. And cartoonists do that because the, the, the space between the frames can represent time elements and all kinds of things. But what struck me was how creative he was with divvying up this grid, which is a great thing about grids. And those of you that have been in the class, you know, we do a whole thing about grids and do some exercises based around that. And you see here, this is all from Cages. He uses a varying styles, like little chapters, different styles of artwork. And then sometimes he completely blows the grid up. So one of our suggestions on creativity was build on the ideas of others. And I've used that concept. This is a circle. I'm going to come back to the squares in a minute. But a lot of times when you're doing designing something, you can actually use the shape itself to divide it up into different spaces. So this is something I recently was working on. It's not a Mondrian, but it, I guess it could be. Throw some primary colors in there. And I put a corner on this. You'll see here in just a second. But what this was, it, and this is back up for a second. If, if you had to think about, without seeing the content, what kind of divisions do you see here? All the rules, the same thickness. So a thicker rule would maybe indicate separation. Is that fair to say? So there's a hierarchy here, really, top and bottom. The bottom half, really not a half. The bottom needed more space. The top needed, needed less space. And within each of those, there's two frames in the top and there's three in the bottom. And so this was a prototype for this uh, new style of uh, hook and loop closure. Uh, I'm not supposed to say the other word. Um, and so the one showed the normal kind and the other one showed this new kind. And it was sort of illustrating that it's quiet. And this was a hang tag. So that's the front of the tag, and the piece we're looking at is the back of the tag. And this is actually out of place, but I'm, I'll never feel bad about looking at Magritte's um, pipe. Uh, it says something to the effect of, this is not a pipe. This is a famous painting by Magritte, playing with the idea of reality and perception. Is it a pipe? Does anyone think it's a pipe? No, no, it's a painting of a pipe. A pipe is a three-dimensional thing that you can put some of the elements we have on the board in and do things with. So this is Magritte just playing that whole sort of perception game. So we're back to this grid. Now, so I, I, um, uh, the, the stuff I'm working on for this company are sort of fold-up visual guides, and they're, they're used for all kinds of different products. And in the course of working on this, we've been trying to find a way to get continuity because there's more than one person that works on this stuff and to get a look and a feel, sort of an order to the panels. So these are multiple panels and I thought, okay, multiple panels, McKeon, um, continuity, things to play off of, just like McKeon used. But instead of a three by three, the space that we had, it turned out to be a three by four. And I'm gonna show a couple of examples here. This is one of these fold-up guides, a draft version. 
and this is sort of just a rough version of it. And there's two sides, a front and a back. And this is a, a zoom in, a close up. You can see the grid overlaid, and there's the content. You see how that's working? So the idea is that the grid is a guide. It's not tyranny. It's not like Magritte. It's not a tyranny of an image. It's a guide. It's a tool. And so you find ways of creatively exploring the boundaries of the grids in order to put things together. But overall, it gives a continuity and a look and a feel to your design. It's something that anyone can do. And if you think about it, when you see things that you like, that you think work well, grab a screen grab of them, make a copy of them, and just for kicks, on a Saturday night when the folks are over playing cards at the house, see if you can define the grid. Because most all of them have some type of structure to them. It's something that you can easily do. Or you can take McKeon's grid and apply it to something else. This was a sketch of a concept for an instructional card for a rescue device. And I did the sketch and I thought I wanted to make it really visual, cross-cultural, not have words on it. it. Had to be images only. But I wasn't satisfied. So I went back and I thought, okay, I'm gonna take the grid. And I'm gonna slap it on here and see what phase two looks like. And this was the second approach. Much more organized a hierarchy to the images. So it really is something that you can use, and it's not at all hard to do. Uh, to do. I do a, um, a weekly illustrated panel for the New York Times, syndicated by the New York Times. And um, this would be true if any of you are doing ad designs, page designs and magazines. The shape that you have, if it's a fixed shape, that shape can give you a lot of leeway to play around with. And this is a fixed shape because it's a, it's a recurring feature in newspapers and magazines, and so they want it to be the same shape all the time. So I have to work within this. Now I'm just going to show you one, build one out for you that, that I did. This was, um, it has a text element, and it has an illustrated, it's basically figured to be an illustrated feature, but it does have a brief set of text, which is, I write it and illustrate it. And it's sort of like Mark Twain said, if you, if you want 2,000 words, I'll give that to you in a week. If you want 200 words, I'll give it to you in two months. It's really tough to write short. <laughs> you have to do a lot of editing to write short. So I've learned a lot doing this. But so there's a text block, and usually it takes some kind of shape, and that sort of defines the space for me. So I've already defined this space because the top has to stay the same. We always ask a question that we answer in the feature. And this was about hammerhead sharks, so I was going to have a background that fell behind everything. It's a geographic feature, so you, know, you always have to think about a map. So I have a map of uh, the coast of uh, South Carolina and a couple of silhouette drawings there that are going to be in the background of some sharks to give you an idea what, where the hammerhead fits in with the other sharks. And because this is about a, a, a hammerhead called a scalloped hammerhead, we're going to build up to that. Uh, the story also mentioned some stuff in Brazil, so we had to have a couple of maps. I had to show where Brazil was in relationship. And then the drawing of the shark went on top of that. So this is the other thing that the grids will do for you. I mean, this is sort of an open grid, but you can also think of it in terms of front to back. And you don't have to have any special skills to do this. You can think about what's the most important content, what's the most important words, and you layer, you layer it front to back that way. Not, not something that uh, you need a high uh, level of graphic skill to be able to do. Now I just want to show a few examples of different things you can do with this. Sometimes we do photo-driven things, it just depends. Where will the space shuttle fleet go next? You know, what happened after the space shuttle ended? Where were all the shuttles going? What makes the Verity Island passage unique. This is a passage of, uh, uh, in um, the southern uh, Philippines, well, central Philippines, I suppose. Kind of a unique uh, biodiversity thing. We try to do a lot of biodiversity stuff because that's an important concept 
for people to get their, eye, their heads around about the importance of that. What spider has an aqua lung? There's actually a, a spider that does a little air bubble. That's what that one's about. The diving bell spider. I like this one a lot because these are neat little creatures. Have smiling <laughs> tarsiers vannies, and uh, they have not. Luckily, they're still around. But so I wanted to talk a little bit more now about this idea of constraint. We talked about fueling ideas. We want to do another little thing here now. Audience participation number two. And uh, I'm heading up to a little something here I hope you will find to be the keys to the kingdom. And if you don't get anything else out of today, I hope you get uh, where we head at, at, at the end of this. So one of the things I often ask people when I'm talking about creativity is what are some of the barriers that you have to creativity? So what do you think? What are some of the barriers? Time. Self-doubt. No standards, preconceived, what was the rest of that? Preconceived notion, did you say? Yes. Getting stuck on an idea. I'll just shorten some of these. Stuck. What else? If you're a manager, what are some of the barriers you have? Talent. Talent. What else? Enthusiasm. Ego. Hmm. Lack, of Lack of information. Cultural. Cultural. Budget constraints. Ah, I was looking for money somewhere. Thank you. Uh, I worked at the Virginian Pilot for several years in Norfolk, Virginia, and Jim Raper was our managing editor. And uh, he would walk around the rim on deadline at night. You guys, enough of you know what the rim is, right? That's sort of the copy desk editing area in a newsroom. That's where the paper gets put together at the last minute. And everything kind of comes together there. He would walk around and whisper in editor's ears, lower your standards. <laughs> <laughs> The deadline is a deadline. And speaking of deadlines, Andy Rooney once said that he didn't believe in writer's block because he had found that if it was 10 minutes to 5 and his deadline was 5, that he could be damn creative. But these are all things that people often say are barriers. Anyone know who these folks are? Bonus question number two. Charles and Ray Ames, preeminent design team of the last century. Fantastic design team. If you don't know anything about them, Google it. Do yourself a favor. Absolutely wonderful thinkers and innovators. I love this picture. Husband and wife team. When you, when you hear them, it's like, oh, there's two brothers, right? <laughs> no, his, his wife's name was Ray. I came across this in the course of um, one of the previous terms when I was teaching visual information design. And when I read it, it was one of those things like, wow, I just found the key to the kingdom. Because like you, I used to put lists like that up about barriers. And I found the Q&A that had been done with Charles Ames back in the 70s somewhere. And I'm reading down through it, and I stuck with it, got halfway through it. And the interviewer asked him, does the creation of design admit constraint? That was the question. And Ames replied, design depends largely on constraints. Now there's a concept. And he went on to say, the sum of all constraints. Here is one of the few effective keys to the design problem. The ability of the designer 
to recognize as many of the constraints as possible, their willingness and enthusiasm for working within these constraints, the constraints of price, of size, of strength, of balance, of surface, of time, and so forth. Each problem has its own peculiar list. And then this is what I wrote in response to a student's question. In essence, all the talk about barriers is just bunk, an excuse for mediocrity, a pilot effort at finding redemption for a failure of personal resolve. Ames offers the way out, a release that frees us from the chains of our own barriers. Now, I hope you can take that and play with that. It's like, what are my parameters? What are my constraints? And what can I do within them? That's a great, for me at least, I don't know about you, but for me, it was a great release to hear that, to think about that, and try to figure out how can I apply that. And it works, because I've been working with that now for a while. I mean, it really does work. OK. We're almost done. Leave a few moments for some questions. But I want to leave you with one other piece of inspiration. During the Middle Ages, I think it was Pope Boniface the Eighth, he sent a courier out around, I suppose mostly Italy at the time. And he wanted to find an artist that could paint frescoes at St. Peter's Basilica. So this is like in the 1200s when this was going on. And the courier ended up in Florence, and he found an artist by the name of Giotto. And he told him what the pope was looking for. And he hoped that he would bring him paintings of angels and saints and demons and the kind of things that they might want on the walls. But Giotto went back to the studio, and he prepared a canvas, and he loaded his brush with red paint. And he painted, as close as you could, a perfect red circle. And he gave the canvas to the courier. And the courier was miffed. He thought it was impotent of him to give some simple something like that to the Pope. But he took it with him, went back to Rome, got all the other paintings out that all the other artists had sent. And when the Pope walked in, he immediately honed in on Giotto's circle. And he said, this is the man. And he brought him to Rome. And Giotto became the first of a long line of Renaissance painters that did wonderful work because of this red circle. But his concept was, if I can prove that I can draw a circle the perfect shape, as well as I can. If I can prove that, my concept is that he would know that I could do just about anything else. And that is exactly what happened. So if you're interested in what we've been talking about today and you'd like to look into it further, this is my shameless self-promotion. Think about signing up for IMC 635. Uh, we generally try to have a good time and and enjoy each other's learning and learn from each other. The thing I, I absolutely love the best about teaching in this program is that I learn something every term, multiple things. It's great. So remember, practice safe design, use a concept. Well, I think we're probably about out of time. We've got another session coming in. So if there's nothing else, thank you very much. It's been great.